All right, we are good to go, and I will stop standing up here and just looking at my phone, waiting for it to turn from 29 to 30. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is great to see you all here this morning, and a special welcome to you if you're watching online as well. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Nathan Drover. I'm the lead pastor here of a team of pastors. And uh, just if you are in person here and uh, you're not aware, we do ask that you wear a mask at all times during the service, just uh, according to our COVID uh, guidelines. We're hoping as, as we move back to normal, hopefully by the, you know, um, the fall maybe, fingers crossed, uh, we won't have to do that anymore. Although I'm not sure what exactly all those rules will be. But anyway, um, with that being said, uh, let's enter into a time of worship this morning. Uh, in order to call us to that worship, I want to read out uh, from Psalm 74, verses 1 to 2, and then verse 7. The psalmist writes, Clap your hands, all you nations. He's inviting the whole world into universal praise. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. And so this morning we want to recognize that God is the king of all of the earth and we want to sing those praises to him. Uh, let us uh, pray to open up our service this morning. Father, I thank you that you are king over all the earth. I pray that even though everything that you have created is yours and belongs to you, that you would come and look on this place this morning, that you would dwell here with us, that you would speak to us, that you would challenge us, that you would comfort us. Um, and that we would experience your love through the service this morning. So God, I pray all of these things in Jesus' name, by the power of your spirit. Amen. Right. You can stand and sing with us. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. Jesus. 
powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. You can remain standing for the wonderful cross. Ah. Uh -huh. 
we're the whole realm. may be seated. Good morning. Thank you, ladies. We're going to do announcements. We'll touch on some uh, birthdays and anniversaries coming up this week. Uh, tomorrow, Norval and June Sapier have uh, anniversary. On Tuesday, Kaylee Braille, some millennial girl, has a birthday. On Wednesday, June Allward and Mark Dear Merchant, birthdays. And on Thursday, Charlene Butterfield. So happy anniversary, happy birthdays, all those coming up this week. And congratulations to the SV graduates. Part of our church, Camille, Brooks, Samantha, Clay, and Ben. A few are here this morning. I'm not sure if they're all, but congratulations on the, for them. Um, don't forget tonight, youth group here at the church, 6.30 to 8. It's going to be the last one for the summer. And the Sunday night, uh, young adults is going to be at the Parsonage from 8 o'clock onward. On Tuesday the 15th and Thursday the 17th from 6.30 to 8, there's going to be a VBS decorating night. So be thinking about those and see if you can help touch base with uh, cat man for that and then on vbs we'll be starting up sunday june the 27th on through the evening of thursday july 1st from 6 to 8 and that's offered for ages 3 to 11 in person and online you can register now on the church website uh, if you can help contact pastor nathan or cat man they're looking for a stuffed parrot artificial plants thin muslin curtain very specific if you have those contact them stuffed parrot artificial plants thin muslin curtain and I'm not sure what those are anyway, I'm a guy <laughs> uh, if you need help to send your child to Camp Shiggity Hawk this summer and it looks like things are going forward there hopefully that'll stay uh, on applications for sponsorship are available here at the church and that's from Pastor Nathan uh, just stop in and ask uh, him or Sheila uh, vaccinations continuing on with our church building um, periodically and just to be a heads up to that if you stop in and see what's going on that's wondering what's going on that's what it is so thankful that they can use that um, care groups uh, Sheila's group for women tomorrow from noon uh, here at noon sorry at the church and Marianne's online care group Friday June 25th 11 a.m. till noon and that's via the zoom and that's going to be their final uh, meeting for the summer that's all the announcements I have, unless somebody has something that didn't get in. Other than that, the kids can go to the river program. Yeah, I, uh, I have no idea what muslin curtains are either, Rodney, so you're not the only one. If someone does, you should tell me after, after the service, because I kind of want to know, although I could just Google it. That's the magic of Google. Anyway, um, I'm just getting set up here. I'm a creature of habit. Every time I go to Subway, I get the same thing, so now that I'm used to having the sermon manuscript on this side needs to be on the side. All right. Uh, well, let me uh, pray before we begin. Father, I thank you for your presence with us uh, this morning. As we reflect on your word, show us the wonder of the love that you have for us. 
and show us what it means to join Jesus in following the way of the king. In Jesus' name, I pray these things by the power of your spirit. Amen. Near the beginning of the Disney movie, The Lion King, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, baby Simba and his father, the King Mufasa, walk out onto Pride Rock just before dawn. As they watch the sunrise, Mufasa takes this opportunity to teach his son a valuable lesson. One day, Simba, he says, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new king. And this will all be mine, Simba asks? Everything, Mufasa replies. As Simba processes the weight of what he's just heard, his attention is drawn to a shadowy, dark land. What about the shadowy place, he asks. That's beyond our borders, his dad answers. You must never go there, Simba. But I thought a king can do whatever he wants. Mufasa, seeing his son's naivety, kind of chuckles and says, oh, there's more to being king than getting your way all of the time. This is one of the main themes through the whole movie. What does it mean to be king? A little later on in the movie, while he's still a cub, Simba gives us a pretty good idea of what he thinks it means to be king in his song, I Just Can't Wait to Be King. I'm going to read you the lyrics. I would sing it for you, but um, I'm, I'm not a singer. So I'll just read you the lyrics. He says, I'm going to be the main event like no king was before. No one saying be there. No one saying stop that. No one saying see here. Free to run around all day. Free to do it all my way. Everywhere you look, I'm standing in the spotlight. So for Simba, at least at this point in the movie, to be king is all about him. It's about his status, his freedom, and his power. The way of the king is the way of spotlight, the way of freedom from responsibility. But at this point in the movie, at least, the question really still remains, what does it mean to be king? And we can ask these same questions about Jesus. What does it mean for Jesus to be king? What is the way of the true king of God's kingdom? And what is our way as Jesus' kingdom people, people who follow the king? In our current sermon series, For King and Kingdom, we've been trying to wrap our minds around one of Jesus' key messages. As it says in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe this good news. The gospel, the good news, is that God's already and not yet kingdom is breaking into our world with Jesus as its king. Now, calling this the gospel, the gospel of God as Mark does, might be a little bit confusing for at least some of us. And this is especially true probably if you've grown up attending church for a long time. It might be confusing because we're used to thinking of the gospel as Jesus' death and resurrection. And that's absolutely right. The gospel, at the heart of the gospel, is Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. And so that raises the question for us then, how does the kingdom of God, the gospel that Jesus preached, fit into the gospel as we're used to thinking about it? Or to put it another way, how do the cross and the kingdom and the resurrection all fit together? This is the question we're going to be looking at over the next two weeks in our sermon series. Today we're going to focus on the kingdom and the cross. What does the cross have to do with Jesus, the king of God's inbreaking kingdom? And what we'll see this morning is that the cross tells us what it means for Jesus to be king. The cross answers the question that the Lion King asks. If we want to know what it means for Jesus to be king, we must look at the cross. This is because the way of the king, as we'll see, is the way of the cross. Now, in order to unpack what I mean by this and what the way of the cross actually is, we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark. And we'll really focus on two passages. Um, the first one is Mark chapter 14, verses 53 to 65. And there we'll see the claim of the king. 
And then we'll look at Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 32, where we'll see the way of the king. But for now, we'll just begin by reading Mark chapter 14, verses 53 to 65. So if you have your Bibles with you or are using your phones, uh, please feel free to turn with me there to Mark chapter 14. And when I read it out, I'll be reading from the ESV. It says, And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple and that, is ma- uh, that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him saying to him, prophecy, and the guards received him with blows. At this point, it would seem like everything had come undone. Yesterday, the Jesus Kingdom movement had the potential to be a revolution that changed the world. Today, Jesus stands alone at the mercy of the Jewish council called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the highest and most powerful Jewish council at the time of Jesus. It had 71 members on it and was ruled by the high priest. In a sentence, this council oversaw the religious, political, and legal affairs of the Jewish people. Or at least, that's how they would have wanted it to be. But there was also another political power at play, the Roman Empire. And so, despite their desires, the Sanhedrin had to operate under and within Roman rule. And one of the downsides to Roman rule, at least from the Sanhedrin's perspective, is that they couldn't carry out capital punishment. Only the Roman government had the political power to put someone to death. And this political situation helps us make sense of our passage this morning, both the one we just read out and the one we'll read later. Essentially, the Sanhedrin wants to have Jesus killed, but in order to do that, they have to convince the Roman governor to execute him. And so essentially in this first scene, uh, they are preparing to meet with the Roman governor, which again we'll read about in a little while, and they need to figure out what charges that they can bring against Jesus that are most likely to get him killed. And well, at first in this meeting, things don't go overly well. They bring in false witnesses whose testimony doesn't agree. But in verse 61, that's where things really start to get going. After hearing these false witnesses, the high priest asks Jesus, Are you the king, the son, or sorry, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Now, we need to understand both what the high priest is asking and why he's asking it. Christ in Jesus' day was not a name. The Christ, or the Messiah, could mean a variety of things, but the main idea was that it referred to the king of Israel, a king that many people hoped would free the Jewish nation from Roman oppression. And we can see this as we skip ahead to Mark chapter 15, verse 32. As Jesus hangs on the cross, the chief priests mock Jesus, saying, he saved others, He cannot save himself. And here's the key part for us for now. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see 
and believe. It's an oversimplification, but generally, when we see the word Christ in the New Testament, we can think king. And so the high priest is asking Jesus if he is the Christ, the king of Israel. And once we see this connection between the word Christ and king, we can understand why the high priest is asking this question. If Jesus claims to be the Christ, the king of Israel, then he was also claiming to be an enemy to Roman rule. And if there was one thing that the Romans didn't tolerate, it was political opposition. If Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews, then this would be a good way to get the Romans to execute him. Well, in verse 61, we hear Jesus' response. Look with me there. In response to the high priest's question, are you the Christ? Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is the most direct and explicit claim that Jesus makes about his identity in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus unequivocally declares that he is indeed the Christ. He is the King of Israel. And once again, he points us back to Daniel chapter 7. As we've seen many times throughout this series, Jesus' understanding of himself as the Son of Man and his place within God's kingdom is drawn from this Old Testament passage. He understands himself to be God's king, God's agent, the one who will vanquish these evil beast-like empires that currently rule our world. Just so we're all on the same page uh, about this, let me read out Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and you'll see the connection. It says, And behold, with the clouds of heaven, Uh, There came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, the Ancient of Days is God, and he was presented before him. And to him, that is the son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass (coughs) pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." Jesus is claiming here to be that king. He is the son of man, he says, the king of God's holy good kingdom. He is the one with all of the glory, all of the power and authority. He is the one all of the nations, all peoples and languages should serve. And he is the one who will have everlasting dominion over the entire world. He is the son of man, the Christ, the king of Israel. That is Jesus' claim. But what happens next to Jesus seems to cast doubt on this claim. Now that, now that the Sanhedrin has their accusation against Jesus, they are ready to bring him before Pilate, the Roman governor, to accuse him. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, please open uh, with me to chapter 15, verses 1 to 32. And I know this is a long passage, but just keep your ears out for, like, king language as I read it out. So that's uh, Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 32. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to sell release uh, for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison, he had committed, uh, who had committed murder, In the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered Jesus up to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. 
And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed Jesus in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in the country, uh, from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified Jesus and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide which, uh, to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Are you the king of the Jews? This is Pilate's question uh, as the Sanhedrin brings their charges against Jesus. And it is also the key question of our entire passage. It is this passage more than any other in the whole Gospel of Mark that forces us to ask, is Jesus really king? You may have noticed, I I hope you did, the repetition of the phrase, the king of the Jews, throughout this passage. It occurs five times here and nowhere else in Mark's Gospel. By repeating this phrase, Mark forces us as readers to focus in on this question. Because in many ways, it really doesn't look like Jesus is king. Right after Jesus' claim to be the Christ, the king of God's kingdom, he is confronted by Roman power. And he seems to lose. Would the real king of the Jews be rejected by his own people? Would the real Christ find himself at the mercy of Pilate, a Roman governor? Would the real king be beaten and mocked by Roman soldiers? Would the real son of man suffer the shame and the pain and torture of a Roman cross? Roman power seems to be the invincible beast that this want to be son of man just cannot slay. And this was a good enough reason for people to reject him as king. Near the end of our passage, in verses 31 and 32, the chief priests and scribes mock Jesus as he hangs on the cross. They say he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. For them, the cross was the proof that Jesus was not the Christ, the King. The cross made it clear that Jesus was powerless, shamed, and cursed. For the Sanhedrin, the cross was the definitive demonstration that Jesus was not who he claimed to be. And yet, things aren't so simple. As I've already mentioned, Jesus's trial before the Sanhedrin is the clearest place in Mark's gospel where Jesus 
directly claims to be king. And the phrase, the king of the Jews, is repeated here five times when it is not included anywhere else in Mark's gospel. And then there is the royal imagery of the purple cloak and the crown of thorns. Both Jesus and Mark put the king and the cross together. For some reason, they go hand in hand with one another. Royal imagery is infused into the story of Jesus' crucifixion. As the reality of the cross comes crashing into Jesus' kingdom ministry, it doesn't negate his claim to be king. It blends with it. The cross and the kingdom blend together to make a new picture of who Jesus is as the king. And if we had read through all of Mark's gospel, this is really what we would have expected. This is what Jesus has been teaching his disciples all along. For example, let me just outline a couple of verses in Mark chapter 8. In verse 29, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter tells him that they believe that he is the Christ, the King. And immediately after, in verse 31, it says this, And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. As soon as his disciples declare him to be the Christ, the King, he begins to teach them about his coming suffering, rejection, and death. Jesus and Mark have already prepared us to see his suffering and kingship together. And returning back to our passage, this helps us read everything in a new light. For example, take the soldiers mocking Jesus in uh, in chapter 15, verses 17 to 18. It says, and they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on him and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. When we first read this, we might think that these events reveal that Jesus to be a false and failed king. The crown of thorns mocks Jesus' claim to be the Christ. But in fact, the crown of thorns point to a much deeper reality. It reveals what it means for Jesus to be king. It is here, as Jesus wears this crown of thorns and hangs upon a cross, that we see most clearly what it means for Jesus to be the Christ. It is here that we finally see that the way of the king is the way of the cross. But what is the way of the cross? What does it mean to say that this crown of thorns and the cross reveal the nature of Jesus' kingship? Well, I think we can break this down into two parts that need to be held together. The way of the cross is the way of self-denial and self-giving. And what holds self-denial and self-giving together is love. But first, self-denial. When we think of what it means to be king, many of us probably assume that it means a lot of the things that Simba talked about in The Lion King. It's about exercising your power and getting your way. It's about freedom and a lack of responsibility. It's about being in the spotlight. But this is not the way of Jesus the Christ. Jesus, even though he is king, and even though he has the power and the status and the glory, does not use those things for himself. By walking the way of the cross, Jesus denies himself and his own power and glory and status. This is clearest in the Garden of Gethsemane. There, in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Jesus prays to God. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup, that is his upcoming crucifixion, from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus knows what it means to deny his own will for the will of the Father. Self-denial is the way of the cross. But self-denial is not all there is to the way of the cross. All of Jesus' self-denial is part of his self-giving. 
Self-denial is not meaningful in and of itself. The cross does not find its meaningfulness in Jesus' denial of himself. It is meaningful only because he is also giving himself. It has meaning because he gave his body, his own life, as a gift of love. And once again, if we had read all of Mark's gospel through, we would already anticipate this. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus tells his disciples, Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' giving of himself on the cross was a gift for others. It was, a ran- it was to ransom them. The word used for ransom here refers to purchasing someone out of slavery. Jesus' giving of himself was to purchase people out of the captivity and slavery of sin. It was for us and our freedom. It was for you and your freedom. In giving himself, Jesus demonstrated what it means to truly love, to sacrifice and to deny oneself in order to give oneself to another. Love is, by definition, self-sacrificial. Our world has lost this defining aspect of love. Instead, our world tells us that love is about our desire, especially erotic desire. But love is ultimately about something else entirely. It is a giving of yourself for another, even when it costs you the things that you desire most. Love is the king of all the universe, the king who deserves eternal glory, power, and honor. And instead, choosing to experience the mocking, the shame, and the death and torture of the cross for us. Love is the blood that dripped from his forehead as he wore the crown of thorns for us. Love is found in his nail-scarred hands. Love is the way of the cross. The way of the cross is nothing less than the way of self-sacrificial love. Love is what holds together self-denial and the self-giving. That is the way of Jesus, our King. And we are also called to follow the way of the cross. As Jesus' kingdom people, we are not above Jesus, our King. We are called to walk in his steps and follow the way of our King. And this means that we are also called to follow the way of the cross. This is what it actually means for Jesus' kingdom people to bear their cross and follow Jesus. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, just after Jesus has already explained that the Son of Man will suffer and uh, be killed, Jesus says this, If anyone would come after me, in other words, be his disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Jesus' kingdom people are called to deny themselves at the expense of their own desires, even at the expense of their own lives, and fully give themselves in love to following Jesus. We are called to have a self-sacrificial love for our king. And it is here in giving fully ourselves to him that we find the life and love that we always, we've always searched for. To illustrate what this looks like in modern day terms, I want to share with you a small snippet of the story of David Bennett. I am almost finished reading his autobiography called A War of Loves, the unexpected story of a gay activist discovering Jesus. I would highly, highly recommend it. Now, I can't possibly do justice to Bennett's incredible story in a few minutes, but here's a very brief outline. At the age of 14, Bennett came out to his family and friends as gay. Over the next five years, he organized political events, wrote articles, and was a strong advocate for LGBTQ rights. He also hated Christianity, the church, and especially the Bible. 
Well, one Friday night, he was at a pub, and he spotted a friend named Madeline. Madeline had just produced a movie raising awareness for people with disabilities. And Bennett hoped to interview her to, uh, for a student uh, newspaper that he edited. When asking what led her to make the film, Madeline responded, God led me to make the film. Well, as their conversation continued, Madeline asked David if she could pray for him. And while he was hesitant, he said, yes. Here's what happened next in David's own words. As Madeline laid her hands on me and prayed, the bustle of the pub faded away. I entered into a stillness, a peace. Soon I felt a soft tingling on the crown of my head that slowly intensified, as if someone was pouring oil over me. The warm sensation ran down my entire body like a current of water. It was unlike anything I'd ever felt before. In a moment, in that experience, so totally from outside of me, so totally unasked for, everything turned upside down in my mind. All my searching in religion, in relationships, in atheism, none of it compared with this love coursing through me like electricity. For the first time, I knew God was real and that he loved me. This changes everything, I realized. From that point on, David was a Christian, but his story wasn't over. For years, he attended church, genuinely loved God, and saw visions inspired by the Holy Spirit. And during that same time, he continued to search for a husband. For the first few years of David's Christian walk, he believed same-sex marriages were honoring to God. Well, years later, in France, through a series of circumstances and people who genuinely loved him, Bennett came to a different conclusion. Again, let me read you out his own words. I knew beyond doubt God was asking me to do what I never thought I could. Give him my homosexuality and choose celibacy. It was simple. It was also that hard. My gay identity had to bow to Jesus Christ, and that meant being willing to live without a partner for the remainder of my life. From a sort of loving, desperate surrender, I prayed, Lord, I whispered, you died on the cross for me. You gave me your body. How could I not give you my body in return? How could I hold back my sexuality, let alone my money, my plans, my affections, my whole life? Anything less wouldn't be true worship. But even then, this decision still had to be lived out in his current relationship with a man named Jerome. And it wasn't easy. Again, in his own words, the battle line was drawn between my love for God and my love for Jerome. I knew I was called to love God more than I desired this romantic relationship. I knew it was not God's will for me, but right now, I simply didn't care. But the war of loves grew intense. God or Jerome. My physical self was choosing Jerome over God, but my heart knew it had to choose God over Jerome. I realized that my love for God was stronger than my desire for Jerome. This had never happened before. My heart, I saw, had been too touched by grace to accept broken sexual desires over worship of my beloved Jesus. The choice to give myself completely to God was not one I made as an indifferent, unfeeling robot. My heart was tender, bleeding, human. And it was the costly sacrifice I was offering him, a sacrifice that cannot be put into words. It went against the natural forces that raged within me, but God promised me grace and resurrection strength to help me in my weakness. I was becoming a real disciple, and that scared me. But it also opened a new horizon of possibilities, a new kingdom reality. I knew that the intimacy and love I now shared with God was worth suffering for. Now, the point of me sharing David Bennett's story with you has nothing to do with same-sex attraction, homosexuality, marriage, or celibacy. My point is that David Bennett, 
shows us what it means to be a real disciple of Jesus. He shows us what it looks like to love Jesus, to give ourselves to him, even when it costs us what we desire most. David Bennett shows us what it looks like to choose the way of self-denial and self-giving to Jesus, his king. He is a modern-day example of what it looks like to walk the way of the cross. And that is the same call of discipleship that Jesus makes on all Jesus' kingdom people. It is a call to love him. It is a call to give our entire selves to him, part, piece by piece, in self-giving love, even if it means denying our own desires. To be a Jesus' kingdom person is to walk the way of our king, the way of the cross. As David Bennett testifies to us, it is in the self-sacrificial giving of ourselves to our king that we truly find love. The ultimate question for us as Jesus' kingdom people is will we follow our king by walking the way of the cross? Do we love him? Are we willing to walk the path of self-denial and self-giving love for him? That is what our king has done for us. He denied himself, abandoning his power, glory, and status. Instead, he traded those things for the powerlessness, the shame, and the torture of the cross. And in going to the cross, our king gave his life for you. This is true love. Jesus the king, choosing the way of the cross. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the love Jesus has shown us on the cross. We stand amazed at the way that of the king uh, is the way of the cross. As we reflect on your call to deny ourselves, carry our crosses and follow you, we look to you as our example. We know that it is in giving our lives to you we truly find life. We ask that you would give us this resurrection strength to give our whole selves to you in self-sacrificial love. In Jesus' name we pray these things by the power of your spirit. Amen. Would you stand while we sing, You Are My King. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love.
are my king. You can be seated. All right, well, this morning we get to do something a bit different and uh, pretty exciting. We get to celebrate with and congratulate uh, the class of 2021, our high school graduates, on uh, their significant achievement and accomplishment. So um, to do that, I want to invite um, Clay, well, any, anyone here who's in grade 12 who graduated, so Cl Clay, Camille, and Samantha, um, if you want to come up, uh, we, would, we would love to have you uh, Join me up on stage. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, so um, there are a couple of people who weren't able to make it this morning, but uh, as you all, all know, um, I want to, well, first I should say congratulations to each one of you for your accomplishment and all of the hard work you've put in and what that means uh, for you in your journey as uh, you go to what's next. Um, so just, just so you all know, and for those of you who are watching online as well, we had five graduates this year. So um, the first is up here, Camille, and she is uh, going to Crandall next year to do the Claystone program. We also have uh, Ben Smith as well, who is connected with our congregation. Uh, we have uh, Samantha Everett as well, who uh, graduated. And do you have, maybe I shouldn't be asking you this. No, in the I'm going to go to Umpton and take psychology. Awesome. So she is, uh, just in case you didn't hear that, she is going to the University of New Brunswick and doing psychology? Uh, Presque Isle, Maine. Pr Presque Isle, Maine. Okay. I'm still getting, I'm still uh, learning about the universities. Anyway, um, she's doing psychology, uh, which is awesome. And, um, and uh, okay, next we have Clay. And Clay is going to NBCC uh, to do the electrician program there, which is awesome. And uh, Brooke uh, McCarthy as well, we have, uh, who is connected to our church. And I'm not, I'm not sure what Ben and Brooke are, are planning to do. I haven't actually met them personally, but uh, congratulations to you, uh, Ben and Brooke, if you're watching this online. Um, and so, uh, as, as gifts, we have gifts for all five of you. Um, so we have these uh, gift bags. So I'll hand them out now. Uh, on your hard work, and we have gifts for Ben and uh, Brooke as well, so we'll get those to you, Ben and Brooke, uh, later on in the week. And uh, let me just quickly pray for our grads, uh, if you would join me in prayer um, for what comes next for them, and again, congratulating them for uh, their hard work and achievement. 
So Father, uh, I thank you for uh, these uh, five uh, graduates, for Clay, Camille, Samantha, for Brooke, and Ben. Um, we thank you for all of their hard work, uh, and we pray uh, that you would just empower them and guide them through whatever is next in their life. As they uh, face many new exciting opportunities and challenges, I pray that you would be their guide, that you would protect them and bless them as you uh, call them into what uh, you have next for them. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks. We're going to move into a time of prayer now for, um, for needs in our church and in our community. Um, last time I checked, there was still this situation with um, the fellow uh, Stephen Purley at large and the police looking for him, so we'll pray about that. We're going to continue to pray about racism and prejudice in the world and in our country, in our land. We're going to pray about world leaders making big decisions that impact many, many people. We're gonna pray for the sick in our congregation and in our, in our circles. We're gonna pray for Aaron and for Sandy Crabb in the hospital, Jen Hansen, um, John Mark Ross and y'all, Travis Adams waiting for surgery, Tammy Bragdon, Stella McLaughlin, Marlene's Aunt Pam, Terry Everett's brother-in-law, Brent, Tammy Wright's sister, Carlene, Julie Brayson's asked for prayer for people dealing with some illness and health issues with aging parents. We're going to pray about the pandemic, access to treatment and vaccines, and the reopening that's happening in many places in North America and in Europe. We're going to pray for those who are grieving. We're going to pray for our grads, church ministries, VBS starting in two weeks. Are there any other needs that we need to mention? Okay, let's pray. Father, we come before you knowing that you are the king. You are all-powerful. You chose to serve and to suffer. You call us to a life of service. Part of what we're doing this morning in this part of the service, Father, is bringing before you people that we care about. And we ask that you would not only touch their lives by your Holy Spirit and touch their bodies, but that you would use us to bring your goodness and your um, comfort to them. So we pray right now for people who are sick in our congregation. We pray for Aaron, and we pray for Sandy Crabb, both of whom are in the hospital with really serious illness. We pray for Jen Hansen in Calgary, battling with cancer. We pray for those who are waiting for surgery, Jean-Marc Rossignol and Travis Adams. We pray for Tammy Bragdon's health, that you would restore her to good health. We pray for some who are dealing with really serious illness. Um, Stella McLaughlin, Marlene Foster's Aunt Pam, Terry's brother-in-law Brent, Tammy's sister Carlene. We pray for um, the people that Julie Brayson had mentioned who have various issues and are, um, there's elderly parents and all the needs there. Father, we just bring all these individuals before you and we think of other people that we know who are in our families and our community that need your touch. And again, we ask that you would not only work in their lives, but that you would use us to bring your goodness to them. We pray for the current state of the pandemic and we're so thankful for the good numbers that we've had in our own province in recent days. We pray that you will continue to bless us here and um, bring this pandemic to an end. We pray for um, the uh, rest of the world with access to treatment. We know that there are great um, losses and suffering in other places. Vaccine is not available in other places as it is here. And we just pray that you would make it possible for people all over the world to get the vaccination so that they can put this behind them. We pray for people in government who are making decisions about reopening and um, 
um, we just pray for wisdom. We pray for cooperation and good judgment and good sense. Father, we pray for our community. We pray for our local leaders and we pray for our provincial leaders and our um, federal leaders and we pray for world leaders. And we know that they're even meeting just now in England, the G7, making decisions, wealthy countries making decisions that will have an impact not only on their own people but around the world. And we pray, Father, for wisdom and for humility and um, for good judgment for those leaders. We think about the racism and inequality around the world and in our own country and our own land. And we mourn some of the dreadful things that we've come to know about in the last few weeks. We pray that you would, that you would be active in our land and that you would help us to be part of your work. Father, we bring before you this situation with this fellow Stephen Purley who's uh, being pursued by the police right now. Father, we pray that you will bring this situation to a peaceful resolution and that no one will be harmed. Father, we pray that you will draw near to Stephen Purley, that you would bless him, that you would make your goodness known to him. We pray that you would give safety to all who are involved in this situation and that your will would be done. We pray for those who are grieving some recent loss and some losses from some time ago. Now, Father, we pray for church ministries. We pray for those who are having birthdays and anniversaries this week that you would bless them. We pray for our pastor, Pastor Nathan. We pray for Sabrina. We pray for Sheila and Andrew. And we thank you for all these leaders. We pray that you would bless them with good health and with wisdom and with joy in the work that you have given them to do. We pray for Camp Shiktahonk. We pray that you would use our church <clears throat> and um, our community to, to make it possible for kids to go there and have fun and to see your love and to see role models and to learn about you. We just pray that you would bless the work of Shiktahawk this summer. We pray for our youth groups. We pray for our grads. We pray for Camille and Clay and Samantha and Ben and Brooke. We thank you for each one. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for the opportunity to watch them grow up over their 18 or whatever years it is. And we pray that you will bless them as they think about big transition this summer and then moving into choices that um, will determine their uh, career and so on. And Father, we just pray that you will pour out your blessing on them, that each one of them would draw to you, draw close to you, and that you would meet them and that you would make yourself so known to them that they cannot resist your love. We pray for VBS, and we thank you for those who are working so hard to get ready for a really fun VBS. We pray that you would bless that ministry too, so that children in this community would know your goodness, that they would make friends, that they would see your love in human form, and that they would learn about you. Father, we have many needs some about sickness, some about peace, some about danger, some about future. We thank you that you ask us to bring all our needs to you. The hairs on our head are numbered. And you can work in the, um, in the details and you can work in the big picture. And we, we implore you to be active in, in our lives, in this community and in the world. And we thank you that we can trust you because you are the king. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's all stand one more time for one final song. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings, yeah you were, yeah you were. Now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things, angels 
angels and saints cry out, we join the mass, we sing glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. So I can praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. Let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God. Well, this morning, as we heard, the way of the king is the way of the cross. This way is defined by self-sacrificial love that Jesus showed for us on the cross. As Jesus' kingdom people, we are also called to walk in this way. We are called to give all of ourselves to Jesus Christ out of our supreme love for him. So as you go this week, may you live out your self-sacrificial love for Jesus, our King. And as you do, may you find his promise to be true, that in giving yourself to him, you will find the life and love you've ultimately been searching for all along. Amen.